In John chapter 9, as Jeff has so beautifully pointed out, Christ Jesus had healed a man that had been born blind. And this man immediately became a believer in Jesus the Christ. And as a result, he was excommunicated. John 9 verses 22 and 34. Christ finds this man. He wants to speak unto him a beautiful allegory. Uh, the Greek word parabole is not found in this text. It's actually a proverb or an allegory. And in this allegory, there are the, what uh, we sometimes refer to as the double I am. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. And as Jesus Christ enters into this discussion, we see the, the beautiful and the tender relationship that God the Father has with mankind by the fact that he is like the good shepherd. And he's making a contrast between the good shepherd and those bad shepherds. And, uh, and again, Jeff has talked about that. I'll talk about that a little bit. But at evening, the uh, sheep would come into the safety of the sheepfold. And as they would enter into the sheepfold, the shepherd would carefully examine each sheep and look for cuts or, or abrasions or bruises. And uh, he had some special oil that he could apply to them if he uh, thought infection might become a problem. But once they were all safely inside the sheepfold, uh, the shepherd then would uh, take care of the entrance and would protect the flock at night. So in, verse, in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 13, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. So Christ, in making this contrast as the good shepherd, verses 11 and 14, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees being described earlier as thieves and robbers, verse 1, verse 8, verse 10, and also the strangers, verse 5, and also they are likened to hirelings in verses 12 and 13. And again, there are those that, uh, these are those who did not care uh, for individuals. And again, Jeff did a wonderful job in pointing out the lame man of John chapter 5, the woman taken in adultery in John chapter 8, and of course this man that had been born blind in John chapter 9. They had no care, they had no concern uh, for the individuals. And just as God's prophets of old had condemned some of the religious leaders of their day as being bad shepherds, Jeremiah 23, verses 1 and 2, Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 10, Christ points out that there are those bad shepherds in his day. And as we look around, we're going to ask ourselves this question, are there any bad shepherds in the Lord's church today? It's interesting to note just prior to his arrest in the garden that Jesus Christ said, And ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered abroad. And, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Matthew 26, verses 31 and 32. And in that passage of scripture, he is actually quoting from the great prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 13, verse 7. Most assuredly, the good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. Uh, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20 uh, and verse 28. Now the hireling is one who simply works for wages. He has no care, no real concern for the sheep. He is only interested in the paycheck. Uh, there are mercenary preachers today, are there not? There are mercenary elders today, are there not? And so as we look around us today, I want us to uh, think about those who, who simply are feeding off the flock until some danger arises or some problem arises, and then they're going to head for the, for the hills. They're going to look for greener pastures. I, I want to remind you that David slew a lion and a bear in protecting his father's sheep, as we learned from 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 and following. My good friend and brother in Christ, the late brother J.T. Marlin, made numerous trips to the Bible lands, and on those trips he would sometimes have discussions with actual shepherds. And uh, he had some discussions with shepherds who told him of how they had to protect their flocks from uh, literal wolves and from uh, sheep robbers. 
And, and so the danger is there for the true shepherd, for the good shepherd, who is concerned uh, about the sheep. And Christ did die upon that cross for us, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. Then in verses 14, 15, and 16 of our text, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The Lord emphasizes three timely themes uh, throughout this section of Holy Writ. I am the good shepherd, verse 11, verse 14. And know my sheep, and am known of mine, verse 14. And again, I lay down my life for the sheep, verses, uh, verses 11 and 15. We have to understand that Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd of his father's flock. And so as the chief shepherd, he is concerned about each one of his sheep. Uh, in, in the real Lord's Prayer, recorded in John 17, Holy Father, keep them through thine own name whom thou hast, uh, hast given me, that they may be one as we are. John 17 verse 11. Christ is indeed the head of his church. He is the good shepherd. We know that the apostle Paul writes and it put all things under his feet and gave, gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23. We also need to put with that Colossians 1 verses 18 and 24 where we learn that the body is the church, that the church is the body and there is only one. And notice please those other sheep mentioned in verse 16. The other sheep not of this fold, not of the Jewish fold, uh, well that would have to be Gentiles. There is no way that anyone can turn to this passage of scripture and uh, say that God gives his tacit approval of the myriad of man-made denominations that exist on the face of the earth today. As a matter of fact, uh, the, this passage is pointing to that, uh, that glorious time when the Gentiles would hear and heed the voice of the Master. And uh, not all Jews are part of God's flock. Not all Gentiles are part of God's flock. Those who obey him are part of his flock. From the erudite pen of the late brother Guy in Woods, listen to this, quote, Inasmuch as there is but one fold, and the fold is the church, there is but one church of which Christ is the door. The division of the religious world into hundreds of warring factions is a situation wholly out of harmony with the parable of the sheepfold. It is impossible to see any resemblance between the picture which he presents in this parable and the hundreds of alleged sheepfolds existing today, unquote. That's from the Do uh, Gospel Advocate Quarterly for the Fall Quarter of 1973, page 25. When Jew and Gentile obey the gospel of Christ, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and following, Acts chapter 2, uh, Galatians 3, 26, 27, Romans 6, verses 3 through 4, they constitute that one fold, that one fold under one shepherd. And that shepherd is Jesus the Christ. And again, if I can appeal to my good friend and, uh, and brother, the late brother J.T. Marlin, he would tell me on, uh, he told me on one of those trips after he had returned how he uh, saw a shepherd and a guide and the guide went up to the shepherd and asked if they could change clothing, change garbs. And so the shepherd uh, allowed him to take his staff and to put on his garments. The two men stood on opposite sides of the fold and the sheep were allowed to come out one at a time and each man called the sheep to him. And JT said not one time, not one time did the sheep follow the wrong voice. And the same thing holds true today for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We must hear his voice and only his voice. John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my sayings hath one that judgeth him. The word that I spake, the same should judge him in the last day. In verses 17 and 18, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Uh, this commandment have I received of my father. 
Now, once again, we understand that Christ is emphasizing the fact that he was going to be laying down his life uh, for his sheep. The crucifixion of Christ was not a regrettable mistake as per the teaching of premillennialism. Premillennials claim that uh, Christ came to his own and his own received him not and therefore the Godhead was caught off guard and they had to come, uh, come up with a plan B. They had to come up with a backup plan and they tell us that backup plan was the church. And I submit to the premillennialists they need to go back and reread Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11. Because in that context we're talking about the church. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words the death of Christ upon the cross was planned from before the foundation of the world by God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ was placed upon that cross, when those soldiers had secured his body uh, firmly to that tree, and they began to raise that cross ever so slowly until finally it would reach its apex and allow that cross to fall into that prepared hole in the ground with a dull and resounding thud, those who were standing nearby more than likely heard a holy groan. You and I cannot really imagine the pain and the agony of the cross. But Christ Jesus came to die for his sheep. And only for his sheep. The cross was his voluntary sacrifice. It was pointed to by prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Psalm 22 verses 7 through 8 verses 16 through 18. Psalm 31 verse 5. Psalm 38 uh, verses 11 through 13, Psalm 69 verses 20 through 22, Isaiah 50 verse 6, Isaiah 52 verses 2 and 3, Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 12, and, and the list goes on. There are literally hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that are all seen to have their fulfillment in the, in the coming of the New Testament and the coming of uh, the history of this world. On the day that Christ Jesus died upon that cross, darkness covered the entire land from 12 o'clock noon until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Matthew 27, verse 45. And as that ninth hour had passed, the light of the sun returned, and the Son of Man gave up the ghost, Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. You will recall that the veil of the temple was, uh, was rent or torn in two from top to bottom, Matthew 27, 51. Now at that particular point in the day, uh, that would be a time when the priest would be in the holy place in order that he could offer, uh, offer at the altar of incense. And this was the time of prayer, Second Chronicles chapter 31 verse 2, Exodus chapter 30 verses 7 and 8. Meanwhile, other priests were going to be out in the courtyard. And they would be out in the courtyard at this time of the day for the burnt offering. Now the burnt offering, the evening sacrifice was, uh, was, was directed of God according to Exodus chapter 29 verses 38 and 39. That offering consisted of a sacrificial lamb. And while the sacrificial lamb was being offered, the lamb of God died on a Roman cross for your sins and for mine. The religious leaders of that day were supposed to be God's shepherds taking care, watching for God's flock. But like those of old, they were miserable failures. When we go back and reread from Ezekiel 34 verses 1 through 6, Jeremiah 33, 1 through 6, and we look at those bad shepherds, and then we look at what Christ has to say to those religious leaders of his day and of his time, we understand that there is a definite similarity. And remember that Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them for they were as sheep not having a shepherd. Think about those last few words. They were as sheep not having a shepherd. Mark 6 34. You can also look at Matthew 9 verse 36. In other words these men had a hired man mentality. They were the the hirelings of which uh, Jesus Christ speaks in our text. Only interested in the wages. No care. No concern. Not for the sheep. The church of our Lord is referred to as a flock. Let your fingers do the walking. Let the Bible do the talking. 
When we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, notice what Peter is writing as he writes to elders in the Lord's church. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not, uh, not of constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Twice the apostle Peter makes mention to the church as being the flock. And therefore, the elders have a definite responsibility to that flock. Paul is speaking to the elders from the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Spirit hath made you bishops or overseers to feed the church of the Lord, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And so with these references in, in reference to the church being the flock, we think about the importance of the shepherd, the love that the shepherd has for the sheep, the care that the good shepherd has for the sheep. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were shepherds. Moses and David were shepherds. The announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ was first revealed to whom? The shepherds, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and following. So Christ selected this very important, this very familiar illustration uh, in order to teach the importance of shepherds. As the chief shepherd, he desires and has designated that there be shepherds in his church today. Many a gospel preacher has been marked as hard and uncouth when the real problem was cowardice and compromise among unconverted brethren. Many years ago I met a wonderful Christian gentleman, the late brother Samuel Evans. He and I became friends very quickly. From time to time as he would uh, pass through the town where I was preaching, he would come either by the church office or by my home and would usually visit for 30 minutes or two hours, depending on his schedule that day. And the first two or three times that he came, he started his conversation with a question. Brother Jess, have you converted the brethren yet? And I thought, well, I guess it's a joke. The second time he came, Brother Jess, have you converted the brethren yet? And I got to thinking about it. And it began to dawn upon me. Preachers, have you converted the brethren yet? Elders, have you converted the brethren yet? There are brethren who need to be converted today. Amen. And when we look to the teaching of 1 Peter 5, 2 and Acts 20, 28 and 29, when we look to uh, the words of the psalmist in Psalm 100 and verse 3, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Remember when Peter was writing in 1 Peter chapter 2, the tw uh, verses 25, for you were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. When the King James Version translators use the uppercase letter S for shepherd and the uppercase B for bishop, I believe they're on target. In context, they were on target. After almost 48 years of attempting to be an evangelist of the Word of God, I am deeply concerned that the, one of the most urgent needs among us today is for more scriptural elderships in our congregations. There are too many congregations that have men wearing the title elder. And when you look to the qualifications in God's word, it begins to dawn upon you that many of those men are not. If you have not yet received last month's issue of the Defender, January 2018, pick it up and read it. An excellent article on elders. The late brother George E. Darling Sr. is writing in that article and he talks about the terms evangelist, preachers, minister, pastors, 
Uh, he points out, by the way, that pastors is used only once in Ephesians 4, verse 11. And when he comes to the, the titles of the bishop, the overseer, the presbyter, the elder, he finally comes down to shepherd. And when I read that, Brother Mike, I, I just had to go back and reread that. I want to read it now. Quote, Shepherd, one who has watch, care, or control over others. The term shepherd best defines elder as far as I am concerned. When a man tends the church as a shepherd tends the flock, brother, you've got an elder. We have a lot of men in the eldership who needs a course in sheep herding. The average congregation is crying for leadership. Elders have a serious responsibility, and if they are not willing to accept it, they ought to resign, unquote, and amen. The pastor, the elder, is to tend the flock. That means he is to feed the flock. He is to shepherd the flock. Again, Acts 20, verse 28, 1 Peter chapter 5, and the verses 2. The shepherd in, in God's flock, which is the church, has an awesome responsibility. It is a responsibility that must never be taken lightly. He must indeed have the bread of life before he can see to it that the flock is fed the bread of life. The elder has that responsibility for what is taught in the Bible classroom. The elder has a responsibility for what goes forth from this pulpit. The elders of this congregation, for example, right now, have an awesome responsibility upon their shoulders for every lesson delivered from this pulpit. Not just today and tomorrow, but I mean every day. Every day of every week. The bread of life. The world needs it. And the world, for the most part, as you and I know, is, simply is rejecting it. But ne nevertheless, the responsibility is there. The responsibility is that for the souls that have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. What an awful account will have to be given in that last day if any of that flock should perish. The shepherd of God's sheep must be vigilant and watchful as we learn in 1, Peter, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 3 in the verses 2. And as you look through the list of qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and then you realize the responsibility as an elder, don't you see how those qualifications make perfect sense? For the shepherd who is tending the flock, who is feeding the flock, who is protecting the flock. And yet, let's look around. Imagine what the last 30 or so years would have been like with more godly, qualified elderships overseeing the church of my Lord. What if? What if the Maxwell Avenue Church of Christ, Ardmore, Oklahoma, had a godly eldership in place when Don K. Preston stepped into the pulpit and began to espouse the A.D. 70 heresy of Max King. The elders of the Central Church of Christ, where I was preaching during that time, actually called for a meeting with those men from the Maxwell Avenue congregation. And I was in that meeting. Brother David Johnson, one of the elders uh, there at Central, uh, simply quoted from the latter part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, made a powerful point, and in that point it uh, very easily destroyed uh, the entire doctrine of Max King. And one of the elders from Maxwell Avenue leaned back in his chair, laced his fingers behind his head, and said, I never read anything like that anywhere in my Bible. Another elder in the same meeting said that he had been, been receiving handouts from Don K. Preston for over a year and he held his thumb and his fingers apart about two inches and he said, I'm still trying to figure out if this is true doctrine or false doctrine. Brethren, I submit to you that a godly elder with very little study 
would be able to tell you whether the heresy of Max King is true doctrine or false doctrine, and it certainly would not take him a year to come to that conclusion. Amen. What if the Granbury Church of Christ, Granbury, Texas, could have had a qualified eldership when two families went to the eldership with a series of about 20 questions? Here are a couple of those questions. Do you believe that instrumental music and worship is sinful and unscriptural? The elders reply, no. But one elder disagreed. Another elder said, this church will never have an instrument because it is too divisive. He said nothing about the scripture. He said it is too divisive. By the way, you can go to that church building today and you are given your choice of the instrumental service or the non-instrumental service. Question, do you believe that the Lord's Supper has to be observed each first day of the week, not any other day? The elder said, yes, to the first day of the week. No, to not any other day. Another question, do you believe that Christians may drink alcoholic beverages in moderation? The elder's response, yes, but don't get drunk. Another elder said, people drank in Jesus' time. Another elder said, what if you need to take it for medicine? What if the Pearl Street Church of Christ in Denton, Texas could have enjoyed a qualified eldership as in previous years when they placed a false teacher in the pulpit by the name of MacDever, backing the false doctrines that MacDever espouses to this day? And it's during that particular time period, 2002, 2003, 2004, during that time period, think about this. I've thought about it many times. What if the original gospel journal might have been, uh, think where it might be today, if there could have been found a scriptural eldership at the Forest Hills Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, the Southwest Church of Christ in Austin, Texas, the Church Church of Christ in Church, Texas, and the Southside Church of Christ in Lubbock, Texas. Each one of those congregations had in the pulpit a member of the board. What if the Richland Hills Church of Christ, Dallas, Fort Worth, and the Quail Springs Church of Christ, Oklahoma City, had possessed godly elderships at the time those congregations decided that it would be all right to bring in the instruments of music to be used in worship to the Lord God. And since those two congregations kind of set the stage, I'm sure a hundred plus congregations have followed suit in that path of error today. If only we had godly qualified elderships in those congregations. What if when Lynn Parker had taught and practiced false doctrine in regards to withdrawing fellowship, what if there could have been a scriptural eldership to take him to the side and expound to him the way of the Lord more perfectly? What if the Brown Trail Church of Christ in Bedford, Texas, and Dave Miller had a biblically qualified eldership at the helm on each occasion of that congregation's departure in what has come to be known as elder reaffirmation or elder reevaluation. And by the way, if you would like to read what the New Testament has to say about elder reaffirmation and reevaluation, this teaching is fully described, outlined, and justified in the book of Titus, chapter 5, verse 19. What if? the Memphis School of Preaching, the Southwest School of Biblical Studies, the Sunset School of Preaching, the Florida School of Preaching, the Preston Road School of Preaching. What if, those, uh, what if those schools had been under godly elderships when those schools began their departures from the word of the living God? What difference might have been made? And what if when Max Lucado departed from the word of the living God, advocating that anyone who refers to God as Father is his brother and sister in Christ. What if when uh, Max Lucado for the first time suggested all you have to do is to say with me the sinner's prayer and you will have salvation 
with no obedience to the gospel at all. Imagine what an, act, what an actual godly qualified eldership could have done to that sort of apostasy. What if? And, and don't you see how this list just goes on and on and on? Pat Boone, Lynn Anderson, Rubel Shelley, Stan Crowley, Brian Kenyon, Tommy Hicks, Brad Harib, Ken Ratcliffe, Phil Sanders, Barry Grider, Joseph Metter, Jeff Walling, Steve Flatt. What if, let's go all the way back to Max R. King. What difference would a godly qualified eldership have been able to provide? We need elders holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict the gainsayers. Uh, the New King James Version says to convict those who contradict Titus chapter 1 verse 9. And, and isn't that exactly what the gainsayer is? One who contradicts the word of the living God. The church of my Lord needs strong elderships today and those strong elderships are becoming fewer and fewer and fewer in number. Today there are mouths that must be stopped. Titus chapter 1 verse 11. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Titus chapter 1 and verse 13. May God give to us today more godly and qualified elderships in order to stop the mouths of the false teachers. I have one more page somewhere. I won't get to it. At the very end of time, all humanity is going to stand before the judgment bar of God and each one will be called upon to give an account we know this from John 12 48 Acts 17 30 and 31 Romans 14 verses 10 through 12 2nd Corinthians 5 verse 10 Hebrews 9 27 and again the list goes on the day of judgment is coming preachers and elders and Christians need to start spending less time with Facebook and more time with the book of books, the Word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling a right or rightly dividing the Word of truth. Instead of asking what if, let us ask for just a moment, what then? We will be separated one day as the good shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. Will we, will we be on his right hand as if we were sheep? Or will we be on his left hand as if we were goats? Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. You and I are the only ones who can make that determination in our lives. Thank you for the kindness of your time and your attention this morning.